<laughs> Jesse <laughs> Watson. What are you looking at? Yeah, go on. On your way, sunshine. Trying to intimidate me. <sighs> White supremacists. I thought for those interested, because there are plenty of people interested in this topic, topic I thought I'd make a little, give you a little guided tour of the um, van and how, yeah, what that life, what that life's developing into. Um, the pros and the cons of living as a nomad on the road, perhaps. And also, yeah, where things are heading in that, in the megalithic filmic direction. So, I've made a video before. I made a video when I was first building, when I was putting the solar panels on the roof of this van. Um, but yeah, I thought I'd give a proper a little guided tour now of what it's like now, which is, I've had it for, it's bizarre, seems like a lifetime, but um, actually I've only been in it for um, August, September, October, just about three months. It seems like, like, you know how people say time flies? Well, it doesn't. If you're um, having new experiences, then time goes very slowly worth noting so i i'm um, found this really beautiful spot you should have seen it last night there was it was oh, i got a bit spooked actually i was watching i started watching the fourth series of stranger things in the middle of some flipping woods on the top of a mountain in this silent spot the wind whistling through the pines and yeah, my little stove lit and I got a little bit spooked, I must admit. Partly because I looked outside and there was, I've never seen it like it before. There was this cloud that was really like a snake, like a solid, just one solid white cloud, like snaking over this, this, this skyline. Yes, anyway, there we go. Snakes in the sky. That'll teach me for dabbling with serpents. <laughs> so, yeah, I've got my um, flu up at the minute. I'm burning, I've discovered, sadly, just at the end, it's a bit much with one hand, just at the end of the actual possibility of using it, I've discovered peat. And peat is a wonderful thing to burn in uh, a little stove. It burns, actually some folks have said it burns quite cool, but I find it burns really hot and it burns for ages. I'll show you, I've got these little peat briquettes, but sadly they've stopped making them because they're banning the um, digging of peat in Ireland. They've already banned it elsewhere. Quite what they're, they're thinking. Absolute control. Now, this might be a bit controversial to say, but yeah, they're obviously banning it because of CO2. But they haven't, you know, don't we just, we're just seeing what happens with Germany when it's, with its reliance on getting energy from elsewhere and everywhere else with what's going on um, in the world at the minute. So, you know, quite what they're thinking of banning their home source. So obviously people are gonna to have to import their energy from elsewhere. Anyway, <laughs> so yes, I've got my little flu pipe here. That's the, um, with this, it's actually a cake tin on the top, it's starting to rain. And uh, that keeps the drips from going in and dampening the ash box in the stove. Handy little customization I made there. Um, that is all detachable down here. It's just lifts on and off that rotates it's just uh and the flu pipe inside comes through here and then i've got this cap which goes on when the flu pipe is off and that just gets stored as you might have seen on my other videos that just runs along the edge of the roof rack here and uh, with these two little straps and looks like a rocket launcher the border control said is that a uh, rpg on your roof I said, yes. <laughs> and he said, go on, carry on, get out of my sight, Sonny Jim. So yeah, I've got my two solar panels, obviously. Now I've got this box, 
for storage here that's just got sort of fairly non-valuable stuff in it it's got a spare camping stove with a cylinder thing because now i've updated i'll show you in a moment i've got a gas proper gas cylinder which has just run out underneath where my spare wheel is which is why my spare wheel is on the roof and then i've got these two 25 liter water butts so i'm carrying about 75 liters of water which is a, uh, quite a lot um but you get through water that's i mean it's yeah it's a lot of you are for a weekend but it's enough to last um otherwise last me sort of i don't know a couple of weeks maybe This little stove is kind of a much more solid affair than in most vans um, because it actually has it actually has fire bricks inside it, if you can see. Um, so it's got quite a lot of mass to it, which creates uh, thermal mass, so that when you're burning it, if you have a good burn in it and then the fire dies down, the, the, all that mass of the cast iron and those fire bricks inside the wall they retain the heat for quite a long time um, so you don't have to kind of keep it constantly roaring in order for it to be pushing out heat which is what you need to do if you've got a tinny sort of um, glamping kind of style stove that has no weight to it the moment the fire dies down the heat stops uh, yeah the stove cools down this isn't the case with this so that I can just have a good burn and then it can die right back and then I can sort of get it going again. Um, so I'm not having to, I, it's a lot more efficient with my fuel. Um, I've got, at the minute, one of the issues I've got with this little tiny van I've got, I'm thinking about getting a trailer, I'd like to, but one of the issues I have is that I can't store much wood, which is why I've changed to burning peat. So yeah, I was, I'm burning these peat briquettes um, and it's amazing stuff. Four or so, four or five of those briquettes will keep me going all, all evening. Because this is such a tiny little space, I use very little fuel. Like it gets, I have to have the doors open when, I'm, uh, when I've got the stove lit because it just, it's just gets up to like 40 degrees. I've got, yeah, I fitted this little single, they're quite hard to get hold of, this little single gas burner. And I've got a red six and a half kilogram propane bottle, which gets um, strapped under here. You'll see those red straps. I've just taken it off because it's run out. I also have this, my little, um, my little meths burner, which I've got a tutorial on my channel of how to make these. It's blooming amazing, this. I've had that for about a year now, this tiny little thing. I've just been carrying it around with me. And it's the, it's the most, it's absolutely awesome. When I made the tutorial, I didn't realize if you just pour a bit of meths around the top of it and light it, it primes itself almost instantly. Just you have it burning two or three seconds before you put the mug on, well, maybe five seconds. And um, yeah, you get a very clean little flame underneath it, like a little gas ring. Yeah, and that'll boil a mug of water in five minutes. And I can also, there is a hot plate on this stove, which you can't see because there's no light on, but there's a hot plate on there. So I can put the kettle or boil water or whatever on top of the stove as well, which is efficient. So when the stove's on, I can use that. And again, at the minute, if my gas runs out, I've got a, well, that, secondary way of cooking and this third way as well of making my coffee and things so i'm never in a fix multi-fuel which is a yeah that's a really good way of going on i think this is a little aluminium cool box it's not electrified it's simply a box a simple a simply an insulated box but because it's aluminium it stays very cool it's cold to the touch now and that's a bit it's a bit magical really it just keeps cool inside which kind of impresses me i've got found that at some junk sale in france but um 
Yeah, the only thing with that box, if anybody builds a camper, the trouble is if you're living full time in it, it it's not a very efficient way that it's stored. All the food's piled up inside that, so you have to root around to get to things, so you often forget if there's something at the bottom, you forget about it. Um, all that stuff in a proper kitchen is much, yeah, it's got, it's much easier. Whereas in a van, it's a bit more of a rigmarole. That's one of the things I found. I, I, I'm having to try and discipline myself now, actually. I've kind of, I kind of t took to eating once a day a huge meal in the evening. And yeah, I don't know. It's probably not the best thing for your health, but um, that's the way I, it's the kind of rhythm I started to get into. So I'm trying to discipline myself to be a bit more, um, a bit healthier there and eat more regularly throughout the day. Been eating apple pie and yogurt all day today. last night, <laughs> this huge apple pie, <laughs> proper, proper Yorkshire and stuff. Yeah. This week, I have been mostly eating apple pie. Sometimes there's only onions yeah. for it. Washing. Washing is a thing. Right, though, indeed. <laughs> then, hey, I'm a farm hey, lad. Hey. I've, already had, I've always had a thing with washing, but washing is a... Oh, I've always been uncivilised in that manner. Um, used to hanging around in the plather. But yeah, washing, I've got... Um, I, have, I use um, these, which I got off... There's a brilliant nom a channel for nomads in, in the States, run by an our bearded fellow. Um, who recommended, and yeah, basically they're kind of wet wipes. Got no plastic in them, biodegradable. They're very handy um, for a quick wash um, to keep you keep you from getting getting stinky. Um, and if you can't if you can't get into the rigmarole of um, heating water and everything, they're very handy to wash your face and wash your hands and all of that kind of thing. Um, then also I can wash in the Indian fashion in just in the bowl and heat myself up a pan of water and just uh, in wash in Indian fashion. I've also got, which I must admit I haven't flipping used yet. I bought this, uh, it's like a, in, like a garden spray thing that you pump with a sh little spray nozzle on it. Um, I got that to make a shower with it, but I haven't used it because I need to also build a cubicle for that. And you feel a bit, it's a bit funny standing outside washing in, uh, I'd be all right. But yeah, most places you kind of, there's a road somewhere and people drive by every now and again. So you don't feel quite comfortable enough to start getting into that. I don't. Maybe different if you're in a, in a shower and things, but if you're in a, a campsite or whatever, but um, I need to build myself a cubicle. I've also added one of the fun things, this awning here, I should set it out really, but um, in fact I might do. Let's pull this awning out and I'll show you. So that's tied onto the back of the roof rack. And then I've got uh, this, it's actually two aluminium poles from a tent, from a tent that I got a load of broken tents from a festival a while ago. That slots together and just, oh, that just goes in. I've just cut it so it's just a little bit longer and that just, gets lodged in between the doors, pushes them apart a little bit. Yeah. And then I've got, you see, this hole here. Right, get ready for this. I've got my trumpet mouthpiece. And <laughs> it's a proper bit of uh, proper. Um, so I've got this bit of, it's actually a bit of uh, nylon string off there. A thread string top down through that hole 
and then the trumpet mouthpiece goes in from above and then I've got my bucket and I wind that bit of string around the handle so it's on the ground sorry I'm having camera placement issues there you go so wind that bit of string around and normally happens very quickly anyway when I've got it set up nicely which is normally very easy it's so obviously going being awkward there we go so now the water is running straight down that that string and um, into the bucket so I can catch rain there and build up my water supply nice clean water coming straight off that tarpaulin well clean as you want I mean clean enough hasn't got a load of chemicals in it at least half an hour's rain I can build up um, a, uh, a half a bucket of water which is you know got enough enough for a pot of pasta or whatever and if I'm boiling that or whatever it's obviously going to be clean I've got no worries there also again being a country farm lad I'm kind of you know I believe in yeah well, you don't want a load of chemicals in it, but drinking, well, you don't want to be drinking brackish water again, but drinking, you know, I'm not going to be told that uh, spring water running off the moor or something, as long as it's not obviously brackish, um, you know, that's, I'd, I think you're much better off drinking that than a load of fluorinated, chlorinated water in a city. Um, there's a tiny risk. You don't want to be drinking water if there's a dead animal just up the stream, but if it's a fairly sizable little stream with a decent amount of water running down it yeah the parts per million in my thinking the parts per million of uh, even if there is something further upstream are going to be so low I'd be amazed if you can be affected by it to any great degree um, so yeah there's my water I'm quite it's very simple but it's kind of pleasing and that can just top up my water supplies because it can get quite annoying having to find taps yeah in in england and in ireland here it's quite hard to find a, a tap often in a communal space you can find one on on the beach um there may be a shower there with a tap um but other than that it can be quite a challenge to find somewhere to get drinkable water so that's very handy i can just keep topping up when it rains and the other nice thing about it is that it actually makes you're farming the rain so you actually get a little you've got the downside of the rain obviously you're stuck in your van but you've got a certain satisfaction to seeing your water supply going up so that's a nice thing um funny these little pleasures they make a great lot they make a great deal of difference oh, I One of the yeah, big things I've found actually, social things, is that if you make, if you go onto the road yourself, if you make yourself a, um, a social, if you make yourself a van, which like this one, is really pleasing to the eye. Um, excuse me. If you make one like this, that's really, that's really pleasing, and has a kind of fun, oh, have you seen my drawer locking system? Look at that. See that? It's cool, isn't it? It's the most over-engineered locking system in the world. <laughs> but yeah, if you make yourself a van which is really fun, and it's also got this kind of eccentric uh, curious kind of character to it people are really interested and they want to talk to me and they're they're happy to see me there and I'm aware that it's partly because of the way I'm uh, of their first impression of me is a good one so that's really something to bear in mind if you build a new van if you build a big black camo van that looks like some kind of military expedition and you get out with a load of military clothing on it for example just to, off the top of my head people are probably going to be a little bit threatened 
And so you're likely to have a, a less welcoming experience of people. Whereas if you get out and you look like a friendly fellow with a big beard and uh, you've got a funny little van, people are happy and they've got a new curious character that, that they want to meet and talk to. So that's really something. When you're on the road meeting a lot of people, yeah, you have to think about first impressions. It makes a great difference and it's really worth that uh, consideration you know put up some nice pictures so that people immediately know you're not a flipping pillock you're not there to and um, they know you're not a thief people can immediately see i've got a lot of kind of whatever they can immediately see i've got whatever you could say artistic sensibilities however you want to put it so they know i'm not some they know i'm not there to steal their chainsaws out of their sheds or whatever um, aye, that's a fair thing. What else have I learnt? things behind my hole on a more metaphysical level <laughs> metaphysical more philosophical level it, when I, I spent eight months living in a tent in Cornwall um, a tent I made out of hazel there's videos on my channel about it and that's an amazing um, that was an amazing experience over that eight months Something really, uh, a really deep change came about me. I was in a battle at that time over, I had a property, I had a, a I bought an old sort of ruined house in France. I got into a, uh, separated from my old partner and a sort of battle for possession of that place ensued. Um, and so I had a lot of things on my, I had a lot of, there was a time where I felt like I was being made homeless and I, I was in a way and it was, so I had a lot of, um, I had a really, at my age in life, I really wanted a home to settle down in. I wanted, I, so I had a lot of these yearnings for, for a place to settle and all, all that kind of thing as well. Because I was in France, I had to come back to the UK again, that, uh, what, what would you call it, um, displacement, those feelings of displacement, all that kind of thing. But when I was in this tent in Cornwall, living in the woods, I had a sort of amazing change occurred where living out in the wild for a long time, I got to a place after several months where I felt like actually it's not a house that made me feel at home. We kind of think of our houses as homes as, as our home, but actually I, living in the woods there, I started to, I arrived at a place where I felt actually the natural, if, if you feel a real connection with the natural world, if you're out there and you're feeling the seasons changing, all of those sort of cliches, but if you are actually in that and you and it's genuinely without any intellectual somersaults or, you know, gymnastics to make you think it, it's just happens, you just start to feel a part of that natural world it's just in your face so you can't avoid it you're listening to the wind blowing and the birds singing you it's all there in front of you there in that place you start i started feeling like actually my home was anywhere like that my home was i don't even want to say it because it's so muddied up you're saying so these kind of things are so muddied up with kind of environmentalist cliches uh, and kind of you know yoga channel bollocks but it's actually there was actually a real thing there where yeah I started to feel like I was at home anywhere where I could walk into the woods and there were trees and there, were, and there was um, grass and all the rest of it that actually that was my home and that it was an amazing um, sort of revelation to me at that time because it was really deep kind of pain of feeling that homeless feeling. But actually, to that was a beautiful kind of... Yeah. 
yeah, completely unexpected resolution of that issue to find actually, yeah, I don't need that. I don't need uh, a brick and mortar house to have a home. I can have a home anywhere where I feel, if I feel at home in the woods and in out in the wilds, that's my home. And it doesn't matter whether I'm in Ireland, whether I'm in England, whether I'm in France, doesn't matter where I am. That's my habitat, you might say, rather than actually home. So you start thinking in those terms, perhaps, or that maybe occurs to your subconscious that actually you, you feel you belong somewhere. You belong in nature rather than having to have, yeah, a door with, with a number on it that says that's your house. Which is a beautiful kind of open. It opens the whole world up to you. Suddenly you feel like you belong everywhere. And that's something, that's pretty big. <laughs> there you go. That's just about everything I can impart on the nomad life at present. Um, regarding my megalithic series, which is ongoing, as I mentioned at the start of the video, there is, I'm working towards uh, the fourth episode, which will be uh, bringing some rather exciting developments in the first person realm. I'm trying to really consolidate things into an exciting, interesting format. There's some test footage here, I believe. Um, partly because it's not possible. I chanced upon some of the most amazing megaliths in Ireland in those first, in those first um, two episodes. And particularly the one on Kilcluny Moor and the Three Fingers in Cork were an astonishing location. But the fact of the matter is, most megalithic sites, there's an awful lot of them, are in a corner of a field with a bit of barbed wire running past this thing or whatever in some, you know, newly drilled cornfield. And uh, they're very unphotogenic spots. Also, not to give you the wrong idea, there is an awful lot of very ancient tombs and the like from, yeah, anything 3000 BC around that era. There's an awful lot of them aren't that big. A lot of them are only a meter, a meter and a half high, just little dolmens. So they only probably made the really massive ones when it was a very significant occasion or when they could field a large group to uh, man the ropes, so to speak. So it's easy. I don't want to portray the wrong impression there. And in order to be able to make good, interesting films about other sites, also apart from just those wonders of the world, I'm trying to develop this format which will have uh, enough investigative, um, but also just visually um, entertaining appealing uh, substance to it and that's where I'm going into this first person view with this pipe smoking character so that is going to take a little while I may actually be continuing the series in Wales I'm not entirely sure because it's getting pretty wintry here in Ireland um, and I may be I may head back to the UK for for the, to pass the winter and continue in Wales I'll be yet to find out but yeah there's something very um well yeah, I'm pretty excited about it, and um, so I'll look forward to sharing that with you when I've got a proper um, film built up there. That footage is just very rough first take stuff. I'm just testing effects in it, so don't get the wrong idea there. Um, a lot of that may change. There we go. So, without further ado, I think that is just about everything. I'll wish you well. Stay dangerous, folks. Cheerio. Bye.